Service to others is the career satisfaction that you get from this work. If you could have the satisfaction I have, you will be one happy person. And that's all you could ask for today is things that bring you joy, both in your personal and professional life. You're at the Faculty Factory Podcast. Well, guess who's here today? Dr. Alice Fornari. Hi, Alice. Hi, Kim. It's so great to spend a first day of winter afternoon with you, December 21st. Great. Yay. So it's been over two it. years since we first talked with Dr. Fornari, episode number 36. Alice, we are over 160 episodes now. You were number 36 way back when. Folks, you're going to have to go back and listen to that episode. It will be linked in Alice's little bio under her description. So, Dr. Fornari, last time we talked two years ago, you had a number of titles, including associate dean and professor and vice president. Why don't you please take a moment to tell people who you are and what you do at Hofstra North Northwell? So, I happen to have two feet, which most people do, but I have one foot in one door and one foot in the other. So, one foot, I'm at Northwell Health, which is a 23 hospital system in the you know new york region basically and we have 23 hospitals and i am the vice president of faculty developments for the 23 hospitals so i oversee faculty uh, themselves i oversee residents and i oversee fellows so residents and fellows and then create a learning environment that's appropriate for our medical students that are at the Barbara and Donald Zucker School of Medicine, abbreviated Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. And that is about 30 minutes from the health system, but we use the 23 hospitals as our clinical teaching sites. I'm an associate dean at the medical school where I also do faculty development, but much more focused there on educational research mentoring junior faculty and mid-career faculty since I'm a full professor, so mid-career and junior faculty. And I also teach in the communications curriculum, professionalism curriculum, and um, oversee the reflection curriculum we have, which is integrated into every course, and then also work as co-director of a scholarly concentration in health humanities. And that concentration has a curricular component and a what I would call co-curricular component of activities. So we do have a four-year scholarly concentration in health humanities. And in addition, we just got approved for this coming September. So September 22, I guess you would say, a new scholarly concentration in medical student as teacher So that goes along with my faculty development role, but instead of starting with residents, I'm going to be starting with medical students who want to do a four-year track in medical student as teacher. Alice, what do you do with your other 95% effort? (laughs) Other effort, I have to say, there is one more thing that's quite large in my life, is that I'm in cohort six, which I can't believe it of a master's in health professions education that I direct. We're started in our sixth cohort. We're still, I guess we're we're beyond infancy into toddler. I've graduated four classes. My fifth class will graduate in May. It's a, you know, full master's in health professions education. You have to be a clinician to get in. So I'm very proud to say it's not only physicians. We have nurses, radiological technologists. I've had PAs. Uh, medical technologists. So you must be a clinician, but we have a mixture of people who are very into the education of the health profession. So I direct that program and teach in that program, of course. Naturally. So you've been doing diversity way long time. (laughs) Right, right. Well, um, I know uh, what you're going to talk about today, but let's just kind of, I'm not going to, of course, uh, kill any um, good news here, but Please do share the two, at least the two big highlights that um, we need to share with our community. And actually, there's a third I thought of that I'm going to add in that I think is very relevant to our times as faculty developers. So all the work I'm going to describe that I've been involved in just recently started before COVID. But COVID accelerated the work because I don't want to say I was ahead of my time, but... I was thinking about just-in-time teaching when I was on the last podcast. We discussed it. 
mm-hmm. that as faculty developers, we are no longer privileged with the ability of faculty to sit in a room with us and for us to deliver content and skills for periods of time that people are protected to be able to join us. In the world of medical education today, or health professions education, as I like to say, that protected time is just not there. So I was thinking about just-in-time teaching when we spoke many episodes before. Yeah, over two years ago, right? Yes, so I developed this just-in-time program by email that I would educate people with email teaching tips. It seemed reasonable. Well, it ended up annoying people because (laughs) there were more emails. And then people were saying, well, we like some of the email tips you're sending, but I can't even find them when I need them Mm -hmm. because, you know, your email piles up. So I'm like, okay. And this resident, you know, you should always listen to your end user. So a resident says to me, you just need an app. I'm like, okay, I need an app. That's interesting. What do I know about apps except, you know, for our GPS apps and stuff? <laughs> Making a reservation for dinner. <laughs> well, we did that before COVID, right? Right. So I started looking into apps and I figured I'm in this large health system. There must be somebody who understands. And I started meeting with people and they basically told me they contract out some of that work. And there is one person on the research side who does apps. So I contacted him. And he gave me an astronomical price to make the app to the point that nobody would, you know, budget it. It wasn't realistic. So I was pretty disappointed. So I continue with my annoying email system. I try and make it a little less annoying. Um, I try and package it a little differently. And then I'm in a meeting complaining about not having the money for the app. And somebody approaches me and says after the meeting, I know someone in Israel who makes apps. Maybe he could help you. So I'm the type person, if you don't know me and you're listening to me for the first time, I'm never afraid to reach out, talk to somebody. So I email this person. We get on a Zoom call. Wait a minute a second. Please don't tell me this is a fifth grader in his mom's basement. Well, I haven't met these people. So (laughs) I'm dealing with as an adult, but he does have a son who works with him and tell you the age of the son. They're just geniuses. Isn't that I, I can't tell you the age of his because he keeps referring. My son will answer that question. My son will answer that question. So I know there is some younger person behind this. Because so, every time I ask for something, he always says, my son will answer that. God anyway, bless the young. God bless the next generation. I, so I, he sent me a proposal. It was much less money. I presented it to my superior, who is the DIO for the hospital for the health system. So this app is generated out of the health system, even though it services everyone. He gave me the money and we produced an app on the Apple store focused on teaching. You could all find this app just to let you know by putting into your search engine on Apple store and play for the Android users here, JIT, J-I-T-T, JIT infographic. And it will come up. It's a very colorful app. We'll have it on the podcast. You'll see the the logo, so you'll be able to identify it. It's pretty easy to find. And let's stop here. JIT stands for Just In Time Teaching, J-I-T-T, infographics. Right, exactly. It is beautiful. Very It's totally focused on teaching tools, Mm -hmm. even though it's focused on teaching within health professions education. It's about teaching within health professions education. So we launched the app in the Apple store. We took all these email things I had made and he, we made them, sent them to him and we launched it. And then there was a, a pretty big complaint from the Android users, like, what about us? So we got a little extra money and we converted it into the Android you know, version also. Oh. So we've had, we started out with the first, and that was published in December 20. 20, which is last December, a year ago, just now. So it's only one year old. It's still, you know, not even a toddler yet. And um, over the year, we've made drastic improvements to the app, things that, of course, I'm learning. I was, I'm not afraid of technology, but this is certainly not my skill set. And people would use it and give me feedback. So I'm very excited to say that in July, we did an upgrade on the app. And one of the questions was, is the 
content evidence-based, like where you're getting all this content from. So it was all evidence-based because it was based on literature. There's an area called foundational. And in the foundational area, it's all the foundational tips you need, no matter who you're teaching. It doesn't matter. Everybody needs these 14 foundational skills. Mm. I put evidence-based articles on the 14 foundational skills because I felt that was the top priority. There's a link on every JIT out to PubMed to find the article. In addition, a resident said to me, you know, I'm really in a hurry. I would like to listen to the JIT versus read it, even though it's an infographic. So this is who we're dealing with as our end user. The People point. who don't even want to read an infographic anymore. Exactly. They want a podcast. <laughs> so I decided for the 14 foundational ones, which I did, I would put a podcast or more of an audio file on the app. So I, I don't just read the app. I explain it, the JIT that's in that category. It's all foundational. And I give a little example of how to use it. Perfect. And those audios are between three and four minutes, and they're linked directly from the JIT. Now, this is only the foundational category. There are 16 categories on the app. Wow. The others are clinically specific, like the traditional family medicine, internal medicine, neurology, psychiatry, surgery, OB, pediatrics. I have physical medicine and rehab. And then I decided that I'm very interested. I recently got certified as a healthcare ethics consultant this past year. I passed my test in June oh. because I'm planning a third career in healthcare ethics. It's always been a strong area of interest of mine. So I took a certificate in healthcare ethics and I passed the certification exam and hopefully in the future I'll practice clinical ethics. But I made an I worked with my ethics team that I have at Northwell and we made ethics jits on how to teach, you know, how to have a goals of care conversation, how to deliver challenging news, how to do a healthcare proxy, you know, things you do in ethics. Wow, Alice, amazing. Okay. So moving on, um, I also am very involved in educational research, and I run a course for the health system called Educational Research Skills Development. It's an eight-session course, and that course, I realized I could use a JIT for each topic I teach, like how to write a research question, how to come up with a hypothesis, how to do a literature search, how to choose your variables, you know, how to do qualitative data connection, quantitative. So I made a JIT on each of those. So there is a research tab. Mm -hmm. And then finally, unfortunately, what happens is the other pandemic of racism and um, obviously terrible in injustices in the world between COVID and racism and social justice. So I became part of a committee at Northwell Health to create educational materials for faculty related to the areas of so what social justice principles. Wow. So I said to them, we have this app, it's free. We should have a JIT, a just-in-time teaching um, infographic on everything we're talking about in terms of important curriculum for residents and faculty to know about microaggressions, what is allyship, what is imposter syndrome? What's stereotype threat? What's cultural humility? So all those things are in the social justice tab. That came about as a result of the societies in general focus, of course, on this important topic. So all of those were added in July when we did a major update. The app is actually in redevelopment as we speak in Israel, where the app developer is. And in January will be a relaunch, you know, just an upgrade. Like on any app, you get a notification, you need to upgrade your app. And we are adding four new categories. We're adding professionalism. We're adding quality. And so to teach quality, all the steps, there's seven steps to teach quality. And we're adding self-care and well-being, which is a very big topic today. So I had two holistic nurses prepare JITs on self-care and well-being. And we're adding a category related to quality professional self-care and well-being. Yeah. So those are the three new categories coming on. So in order to have a category, you have to have at least four JITs inside. So there's a category. Once you open that, there's JITs inside. 
And in order to have that, all the JITs now that are not foundational are made by content experts and everything has an evidence-based article link out as of January. What a great repository. I love, isn't, that, isn't this another genius example of how necessity is a mother of all invention, that you have faculty who are annoyed by us trying to be helpful. We're just trying to be helpful. We're trying to tweak our emails. We just want to get you the information. And something in you said, all right, I don't want to annoy them. And it's forced you into this new area. And here you are with this blown out, wonderful repository archive of stuff that's just in time. This is again oh, it's another- in your hand. It's literally yeah. in your hand. Yeah, yeah. Whatever device you know, obviously it could be on an iPad or an iPhone or an Android device. And oh my God, how did she tell me how to give feedback again? What am I supposed to do? And right. you open up the feedback jit. All the the steps are there. They're all done as infographics, so they're not text heavy. One of the things we have to work at, people send us tremendous amount of text to put on an infographic, and we have to say, this is an infographic. Mm-hmm. It's not everything. It's we not a problem. Very ethnically and culturally sensitive. So most of the older JITs were taken, are going to be taken down, and the new ones going up are all culturally and ethnically sensitive wow. to be courteous of our society. And the person who's designing all these not the content, but the actual infographic is my faculty development coordinator. And she has totally self-taught herself this entire infographic process, which is just an incredible feat in itself. So I have to say during the pandemic, I've been very, very busy. And now my husband says I'm a little harsh on myself. So one year out, because I once again, I launched December 20th. This is going to be January 21. I mean, January 22, excuse me, January 22, I'm on a mission to figure out usage of these. So what I have is analytics behind the app. Right. And I know how many downloads there are. I know every country that's downloaded it. Remember, it's free open access medical education. I made a very conscious decision with an intellectual property lawyer that I would not charge for this, that it would be 100% open access, and I would not you know, profit from it. So the free open access medical education, I could see all the countries that use it. I could see the number of downloads, the devices that are used, all that. That's not actual individual usage. So my goal is over the next year is to figure out, because it is de-identified somehow to, um, through giving CME for the JITs, identify people who are using them and then be able to understand real usage of the content and is it working and is it helpful? Wow. Because I don't have that higher level data if you think about Kirkpatrick Mm -hmm. on change of behavior, you know, that level. You see how the application of it. Yeah, that's so hard. Look at you, nothing scares you. (laughs) No, it doesn't. And I really want to, because I understand the criticism of people applying it and i can't answer that question right now so over the last year it was all about getting it right usage having access okay now i'm going to move on to actual applying it to the teaching environments we're in each one is downloadable as a pdf just to let you know so you can use them in powerpoints and you can use them in you know classroom teaching then also, Alice, unbelievable contribution to this space and innovative, creative. I love the ease of access. I love how you listen to your faculty and said, all right, I'm not going to push back and say, well, OK, I tried to do an app, an app, but there's no budget. Oh, well, sorry. No, you made it happen. Isn't that what we do in academic medicine? You make it happen. And you know, I do think I'm filling a big gap, and especially then COVID comes. This is all before COVID, where you really can't see anybody. You can't expect people to be in a room. And now, so I am able to have Zoom meetings and teach through the app because everybody can download it and have it. And then I teach about how to teach through the app. Wow. And I'm doing these as what I would call micro learning sessions, Kim. So I'm creating micro learning sessions, maybe 15 minutes perfect, at the most, 
10 to 15, I should say, really. And I'm taking one or two of the infographics and teaching faculty how to use them in the clinical setting. It, 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 it just, it, this is such an amazing product and process. And it can't, it just re, reminds me of the precision faculty development concept. That, right. Yes. How we've gone from precision medicine to precision education. And in Chicago at the professional development conference for the AAMC GFA, uh, Charlie Irvin and I talked about precision faculty development. And, and it's one of those things like it's how in the world are we going to do precision faculty development for the hundreds of thousands of faculty running around? Uh, this is an example, though, of how tailoring what faculty need in time at the moment at a finger grab without having to go through a thousand emails or shared drives or other kind of books on a shelf thing. This is this is where we need to be. And this is at that moment. And then like you're saying, this is closing the loop. If Alice could figure out that Kim Skorupski, again, the example I gave in Chicago, Amazon.com can figure out when I bought red shoes right. and then I might want a red purse and a red dress and a red whatever to go with the right. red because this girl likes red, which I don't, by the way. But if they, they figure this out, and yes, I know they've got money and it's a different industry, but if you close that loop on seeing that Kim Skorupski keeps hitting the jit about um, self-care and well-being and anything about this topic, she's hitting this regularly. Is this a trigger? Is this a, a, um, a flag something we need to be special attention to or we need to give her more content in that area? Is she struggling? Is someone she knows or her trainees? So you can then precisely say, hey, Kim. Um, we've noticed you've been doing this. How, why do you feel about it? How have you been applying it? Do you need more? Do you want to be a teacher? Do you want to get in this space? There's so, that opens up a whole other level of meeting faculty where they are, what they need, and then inviting them to contribute and share and co-mentor. That's a very important piece. So I am allowing outside people to make JITs. They give me the content my creative designer makes the infographic. She sends it back to them. They yay or nay it. They edit it back and forth. They must produce an evidence-based article for the JIT now. And they get their name on the JIT. See? So yeah. Not me. It, whoever created that content with my uh, creative designer. And so there are JITs that are written, of course, by many outside people I just had a guy in Hawaii uh, in family medicine who said, you don't have a JIT. In family medicine, we use this communication skill called bathe all the time. Could I make a JIT on bathe? I said, if you have an evidence-based article that it's a concrete communication skill in family medicine, which he did. So oh. we made it, and it's going up on the app, but with his name. So it's his product on my app. A shared process. This is where we are. Good kudos to you for persevering and not giving up when someone closed the door on something so ridiculous like budget. And, and you that, know, the amount of people though, it's scary that have said to me, I cannot believe you're not doing this as a venture capital campaign, you know, as a venture product. And I'm like, no, this is what the world needs. Free open access medical education. We are not, we are a community. And I am, I am so glad that I didn't go venture capital. Even 99 cents an app would defer, would deter people. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. What's what? It, this, I, I'm all about sharing good news. This is good news. Share it. Yeah, give me whole talk, talking and the whole other thing. I don't, I don't need the money. I know some people do. Um, this is about giving back, right? We are at stages of our career where that's all. Get, that's what we do in academic medicine. Are you kidding me? Look at our faculty. They're giving so much. They right. Nothing left to give. I want to hear more about the next thing because I want people to know about the new exciting thing coming out. So um, over the years in medical education, I have become very blessed of having terrific mentors. And then, of course, giving back, as Kim is just mentoring, by being a mentor to others. And I've been involved in the International Association of Medical Science Educators, which is an international medical education organization. And I got involved with them when I was at Einstein Medical School before my current position. And I continued to stay involved with them because with the establishment of a new medical school and they were very focused, getting focused on the integration of basic and clinical science, it just really worked. 
So I wrote a manual for them, a how-to manual on active learning. I, they were had a call out for manuals, and I found another colleague in IAMC who I really enjoyed working with, and we did a manual on how, the how-to of active learning. And that was very exciting. It's been very successful. It sold through IAMC initially only, but then when Springer took over their journal, the manuals have transferred to Springer, which is a medical education public. Well, it's a publishing company that has a medical education division. Then they had a second call for manuals. So I contacted my co-editor of the other manual and said, hey, let's do another manual on mentoring. And she said, Alice, I have totally changed what I'm doing in my life. This is pre-pandemic, which is interesting. I'm no longer doing whatever she was doing. And, you know, I'm just not the right person for you. I'm not even in academic medicine anymore. I'm like, okay. So um, I sat there and I'm always somebody who likes to do projects with people. You know, I'm, I'm very much connected to doing things collaboratively. So um, my co-editor on the new manual called Mentoring in Health Professions Education, Evidence-Informed Strategies Across the Continuum is Dr. Darshana Shah, who is in um, West Virginia at the medical school there, which is very exciting. So I knew Darshana actually through IAMC, but all through through the Harvard Macy Institute, which we're both heavily involved in. And we always just got along and really clicked and we're just, you know, we'd go to like so Amy in Europe and we would be so happy to see each other because she's in West Virginia, so it's obviously not near New York. And luckily, I had just been there before the pandemic as a visiting professor. So she's at the Marshall School of Medicine in West Virginia, and she invited me down for a visiting professorship. So that was a really great visit, and it was pretty soon before I was just deciding on the manual. And I said, let me see if she'll do it with me. And I called her up, and she said I'd be thrilled. So we did the manual together, which has been a lifesaver because I never could have done this alone. It might be my last journey, even though my husband said I should do another one. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like who knows. But right now it's coming out the end of the month, which is next week. Supposedly spring of promise within 2021. So they have about a week <laughs> to meet their promise. Ten days, I guess, actually. And I'm so proud of Kim because she has a chapter with her colleague. She can mention who that is. Jennifer Lee yeah. Faculty Longitudinal Career Mentoring is her chapter. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of her chapter is that, you know, sometimes you do right on spot mentoring. We sometimes we call that speed mentoring. There's a chapter on speed mentoring mm -hmm. by another wonderful colleague, Suba Romani. But this is longitudinal career mentoring. Mm -hmm. And Kim and her colleague prepared that chapter. So I must say the most rewarding experience part of this experience, because there's many things that are quite tedious when you get involved in publishing and books, is that every author I ask to write a chapter, minus two people, and there are 16 chapters, so that wasn't bad, said yes to me off the bat. Just yes. And they were the top people. And the reason I found them, I knew most of them, but I did lit searches on every topic I wanted. And the big names that came up, I went to those people and asked them. And this just goes to show you that, I mean, how, how many tens of thousands of dollars did you pay us, Alice, for those chapters, right? <laughs> she just spit out her tea or got me, nah, we don't do this for the money. And, and folks, everybody listening who's written, when you've written a book or manual, this was so hard. I would get, we would get so many emails from Alice and Darshana. And I thought, how did these these women handle this. But then I remembered Darshana is also a person like you who just, oh, by the way, I created a whole new journal. I mean, <laughs> you want right. something done, you ask the busiest people, you know, it's a competent, I used to call it the competent woman syndrome, but I had to recall the competent person syndrome, as we all know, you want something done, um, go to someone who's like a Darshana. I, I Darshana was perfect because she had created the journal. So the, at, for the um, Marshall School of Medicine. So she really was a perfect person and is, of course, an amazing mentor. So that was great. But it was interesting, um, you know, so I only had to go to a second tier of people for two chapters. And one, both of them worked out absolutely beautiful. Um, 
with no hesitation on the outcome of the chapters at all. And when I think when we see the book published, the 16 chapters, we're going to be so, so in awe of how we're all in one book together, because it's really some of the masterminds of, um, you know, medical education that are in the book. Um, I really have some of the best of the best. Um, okay. so, are you going to make them jits? Are some, can some of the things be jits? Well, the next thing would be, could we make a jit from every chapter in the book and have then a mentoring tab? We don't have a mentoring tab on the category on the jit. There you so go. The now you do. <laughs> could, when the book is out, um, I could discuss with Melissa, my creative designer, because she basically at this point, if I give her an article, she could basically make a JIT for me. And then, of course, I approve it. So that could be a long term project. But I'm very excited for this book coming out because most important is I'm a true believer in mentoring. Luckily, I was a, got a big honor this year from my AMC. I, I got their Lifetime Achievement, Lifetime Career Achievement Award. Unfortunately, I got it on Zoom versus Cancun, Mexico, but I did get it. And I, um, for my work in teaching and educational research, and I only got here because of mentoring, and I only want to give to others so they move forward in the mentoring area. And that is really super important to me that um, that happened. So I believe that all of us have to mentor. You don't have to wait till you're in your senior part because there are things to share when you're more junior. And then of course, there's always our trainees and our students that need mentoring. So I'm hoping this book is useful and I'm very excited to see it you know, being published in this year within the next 10 days. Another piece of my COVID, I call it my, you know, what did you do during COVID yeah. question? So I have the app and I have um, the manual. That, and I have my master's program that's doing super well. And then I'm um, also, you know, expanding my mentoring in general. People really, you know, I don't know if you found this, Kim, you know, people started reassessing their lives a little bit during COVID and I'd have people call me up. So Alice, you know, what do you think I should do and all this? So actually my mentoring fingertips on people or spreading my wings with mentoring, I think people, you know, had a lot of reflective processes during COVID about how am I going to spend the rest of my professional life? So mentoring is a very, very important aspect of career development today that I really love. And then, of course, I have this very strong interest now in clinical bioethics. So, right. and, you know, it's really important that you prepare. Um, I'm not, you know, the type of person to truly retire, even though no I'm kidding. Planning, no kidding. <laughs> I'm planning this third career. Like tomorrow morning, I'm actually doing a practicum at a hospital in bioethics. I'm going around with the bioethicist and we'll do consults or whatever is happening on the ethics service. There's a service because I don't feel, even though I got certified, I passed an exam, took a course, all that stuff. I still don't feel I can handle an ethics consult on my own. I guess I'm like an intern, you know, like an intern, like you, you, you have knowledge, you went to medical school, you did all that clinical clerkships, but I, you, everything's going to be looked at. So I'm trying to do um, two practicums a month to really up my clinical ethics skills and being able to do ethics consults. It's much more complex than I imagine based on variables, what's happening. Um, very, very complex cases. Now, so, if you're being a little bit too humble, I think this is a person who creates the JIT, writes the manuals, gets certified in healthcare ethics, teaches the the... the courses, get some lifetime career development award. Do you think, yeah, I don't know if I feel like I could do them by myself. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> no. So I am being supervised a little, but hopefully I get my courage up. So um, I'm thinking like a two year out plan to maybe transition into clinical ethics as a part-time career. I do have um, three children, five grandchildren, and more grandchildren will be coming from my third, my other two are done. But I think about, you know, being a little more available 
in my personal life than I currently am. I'm pretty busy, but um, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Oh my actually. gosh. I, yes, we definitely will see a lot's going to be happening. I suspect strongly. I just want to take this moment to kind of put it out there. I'm going to give you Alice, doc, uh, Alice Fornari's, Dr. Alice Fornari's email address. And that is a for Nari, A F O R N A R I at Northwell.edu. Northwell, N O R T H W E L L.edu. And yeah, if you want to pick somebody's brain about how do you write a book or how do you do an app, definitely download the JIT infographic. So it's just in time, JIT, J I T T infographics app. If you want to learn about healthcare ethics, my goodness, you just got certified, Lifetime Career Development Award, mentoring and coaching. I mean, you didn't say that you were a coach, but it sounds like you're doing a lot of coaching. So I am. Is- so actually, just to mention that I feel like I do a lot of coaching and I have looked into coach formal coaching certificate programs, Kim. I have never taken a formal program. I do a tremendous amount of coaching to the best of my ability, and I definitely have looked into coaching programs and thinking maybe in mid 2022, I want to get the app more where I want it to be before I take on another big project. Of so course. Mid, of course. Mid, 20, <laughs> mid 2022. Um, the app, you know, still needs a lot of work, this concept of application, that level. Mm-hmm. So I'll see, maybe um, I have considered a coaching um, course. And that's another whole complex field. If you start looking into coaching courses, oh my God. Yeah, so I, I, I just got certified. But but let me tell you something, Alice, this is something, again, I think it's many of us in academic medicine share a lot of the same traits that you mentioned it earlier, I think a little bit of the imposter syndrome. And we're, and we're clearly live the life of the mind and we're smart people and we're hardworking people and we're, we do something and we, we push for it. You're all, yes, the certification is good, but to me, I have no doubt that if I'd ever reach out to anybody who talked to you or you advised or mentored or sponsored or coached, they would say, yeah, great coaching. So yes, the certification is very valuable and you'll learn a lot. And that said, that's well, I'm not that's I definitely am in the look, looking phase of that. And, um, you know, I agree. Like, I feel, of course, I have to understand my own limitations, but I feel like I can help people move forward. I just helped a, a fat, one of our best faculty members make a decision to move on to another medical institution in New York because mm-hmm. it was the best career for her, Same. you know, and it was a tough decision and we worked through it. And um, I think tomorrow's her last day with us, but it was the right decision for her. That's right. Well, that's where we are. This is not about us. And everything you're describing just really um, punctuates that notion that we, we're not in this for to us. be rich no. or famous. It's, right. it's to serve. And so thank you for everything you're doing and your energy. I can't see you ever stopping. And um, this is- I agree like, with you. Service- Service to others is the career satisfaction that you get from this work. If you could have the satisfaction I have, you will be one happy person. And that's all you could ask for today is things that bring you joy, both in your personal and professional life. Well, well said. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hope. Someone said something about 23 today. Said, no, we have to stay with 22. Let's hope for 22. Let's we keep can't in the worry. moment. Be in the moment. Alice Bernard, you are amazing. You are a fireball. I am just so impressed by everything you do and the way your brain works. Please take care of that brain. <laughs> I will. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the time together. Okay? All right, folks. Tune in next time to the Faculty Factory Podcast. Bye now. Bye bye. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, 
visit facultyfactory.org.